Welcome. Today I'm going to give you an example of how we go about doing science. And this is an example of research that I've done just recently with my sister, who's uh, an ecologist, and her daughter, actually, a, st uh, a student at Calvin University. And the question we wanted to address is, do individual black-capped chickadees vary in their winter foraging behaviors? And here's a picture of the feeder, one of the feeders we used with the black-capped chickadee sitting on top of it. And this feeder is located in the Arboretum. And I wanted to tell you about this research because I want to remind you that you as students can do research in college. In fact, it's a pretty cool experience. And so I encourage you to seek out research opportunities wherever you can. So let me tell you about this research. The first thing we needed to do was a little bit of background information to learn more about, um, about this animal and the questions that we wanted to ask. So it turns out black-capped chickadees are small birds that you're probably really quite familiar with. They are year-round residents in Michigan. They live right here on Grand Valley's campus, and they um, are probably one of, if you know any bird species, you know this one. Okay, well it turns out that because they live here in the winter, they have some foraging challenges, right? In the winter when there's snow on the ground, it's difficult to find food. And whenever animals go out to find food, they face risks of predation. So animals like hawks and snakes and things like that can prey upon these little black-capped chickadees. So foraging animals must make trade-offs. Sometimes finding, finding food is absolutely necessary, and sometimes it's worth the risk to go out and find food um, because you need food to survive. But when you're out there looking for food, it can be scary. There's predators out there, right? Well, <clears throat> we had learned that a lot of research has been done on uh, winter foraging habits of black-capped chickadees and how the presence of a predator can influence black-capped chickadees and other birds. Uh, and so we had already seen some research. We did some library research and found that uh, some researchers suggested that even the position of a predator, if you put a predator near a feeder, birds are going to avoid that feeder. If you put a predator near a feeder with its head facing the feeder, birds are scared, more scared than if you put the predator with, its, with the back of its head facing the feeder. And so even something like the position of the predator relative to the feeder can make a difference. Well, we were interested in looking at how, bird, uh, how our black-capped chickadees um, dealt with the presence of a predator near the feeder, and are there individual differences between uh, birds? Are some birds more risky? Are they willing to take a risk that other birds don't? Are there differences in personality between some of our black-capped chickadees? A lot of researchers have studied personalities like bold versus shy personalities in sometimes in birds but also in fish and in other animals and so we were interested in in trying to sort out are some birds braver than others or bolder than others so we first needed to trap some black cap chickadees with mist nets and um and that's what we're doing here my sister and her daughter are um, getting several birds out of the mist nets that's been placed up near the feeder. The birds accidentally fly into the nets and the nets capture them. And once they're removed, we would take them and band them. Here's Laura and my sister Cheryl banding, um, looks like a downy woodpecker, but in the picture we've got a black-capped chickadee that is color banded. This black-capped chickadee has a, a unique sequence of color bands on it so that we can recognize those color bands when we're out in the field, if we were videotaping the feeder, for example. And so we banded about 30 black-capped chickadees in the Arboretum at Grand Valley's campus so that we could identify different chickadees. <clears throat> and then we set up an experiment to test several hypotheses. The first hypothesis went like this. 
black-capped chickadees will forage so that they minimize their predation risk. That makes sense, right? They're going to minimize their predation risk. So if that's true, then our specific prediction might go something like this. If foraging at a feeder, black-capped chickadees will visit the feeder more often, will spend more time at the feeder, and acquire more seeds when there is no predator present versus when a predator is present and shows up at the feeder, okay? Well, <clears throat> how could we set up an experiment to test this hypothesis? What kind of trials am I going to set up? What behaviors am I going to measure as I collect data? We worked out uh, an, uh, an experimental design that we thought would effectively test this hypothesis. And in this picture, you can see that we have a feeder, a platform feeder, and a GoPro camera watching the feeder so that we could identify birds that came to the feeder later. And in this picture, you can see about a meter from the feeder is uh, a hawk. But this hawk is a stuffed hawk. It's taxidermied. And it's a cooper's hawk. This would be a pretty important predator on black-capped chickadees. We came up with a design that looks something like this. We decided to divide the, um, our trials into phases. And first, we would present a pre-trial just with no predator present. We would simply watch the birds at the feeder. Then, a 15-minute trial where the hawk was present. Then, a 15-minute post-trial after the hawk is gone, what happens for 15 minutes? And then a break. But we also thought, I wonder if we need to have some sort of control. We have a predator present, and we have the pre-stimulus trial or the pre-trial, but but maybe just the presence of anything novel is going to scare the birds. You know, maybe it's, it's not just the predator, but what if it's like a regular other little songbird that if you put anything on a post near the feeder it will affect the, the animal's behavior. So we decided to use, as a control mechanism, we decided to use a songbird called a tufted titmouse and present the songbird also for a 15-minute trial. So we'd have another set of phases with 15 minutes before the songbird, then 15 minutes of the songbird, and then 15 minutes after the songbird. We could then compare uh, the behavior of our chickadees before a stimulus appeared, when the hawk or songbird was present, and after the hawk or songbird was removed. So notice that I'm using proper controls here. And then we started looking at the results. And the results are complicated. The, there are a number of them, and, and I, I'll show you just a couple of them. This graph shows us the results of the number of visits made to the feeder as a function of phase. So pre-trial, songbird phase, the post-songbird phase, the predator phase, when the predator is sitting by the feeder and then the post-predator phase. We wanted to compare the number of visits that birds made to the feeder, right? In this particular graph, can you circle the independent variable? The independent variable, the one that we control, would be always on the x-axis, okay, the phase. In this case, we control whether it's a pre-trial or a songbird trial or a predator trial. The dependent variable will always be up here on the y-axis, and it's, in this case, the number of visits that birds make to the feeder during this 15-minute phase. Right? We can look at a number of different dependent variables in this study. One of them we looked at was the number of visits. When we plotted the graph, these dots here represent each of the trials that we performed. We performed 40 trials, 40 different trials with six phases per trial. 
And these are the averages with the standard error bars here for all of the trials. What do you notice? Well, right away you notice that during the predator trial, birds didn't visit the feeder very much. No surprise, that predator is scary. During the songbird trial, birds visited the feeder almost as much as they did in the pre-trial phase. And after the predator was removed, birds came back. These data are significantly different from each other. What conclusions can I draw? Can I prove that my hypothesis is true? No, I can't prove that birds are visiting the, or, or that, um, that my hypothesis, let's go back, that our birds are minimizing their predation risk by visiting the the feeder less often when a predator is present. But the data certainly support that hypothesis, don't they? Here's a second set of results. When I looked at how much time are they spending at the feeder, birds, the, the black-capped chickadees tend to go to the feeder and then leave. But are they spending less time when there's a predator present? So how much time are they spending as they make a visit to the feeder? Notice that when the predator is present, they're spending, you know, a little over two seconds at the feeder. When the predator isn't present in all these other phases, they're spending uh, three and a half, four seconds at the feeder. That's a little bit longer. So they are being wary at the feeder. They're coming in and grabbing a seat and heading out fast when there's a predator, right? And how long does it take them to actually arrive at the feeder after the predator has come? Well, in the pre-trial and the songbird and the post-songbird and the post-predator phases, the birds come almost right away. After we start the trial, they, they're coming within a minute or two most of the time. But when there's a predator present, sometimes the birds never even came. All right. So when there's a, pre a predator present, we had um, a significant latency difference. So all of these data are really support are, are supportive of my hypothesis. But our second hypothesis is a little bit harder to test. Our second hypothesis dealt with individual variation. Black-capped chickadees will show individual variation in their winter foraging behaviors at feeders. And our specific prediction is that individual black-capped chickadees will differ in the number of visits they make, the time they spend at the feeder, the um, number of visits they make during the predator trials and the number of seeds they acquire, we can come up with a lot of specific predictions here. We think some birds are going to be bolder than others, and we identify the birds based on their color bands. So here we've got a bird coming, flying into this feeder. You can see the color bands are orange, silver, white, orange. So that guy is called O-S-W-O. So Oswo is what we called him. He's an individual. We can compare his results to other results. We don't know how to statistically do this. This is really complicated and so we're looking into that right now. But if we look at, say, the number of visits that each bird makes, each bird is represented here by a different color line, during the phases you can see there's a lot of variation, right? Some birds are coming all the time. Right? Some birds are coming frequently to the feeder. Other birds are barely ever coming. Some birds are coming, <laughs> very few come during the predator phase. But in the post-predator phase, the birds, some of the birds come back. We're interested in why are there variations here? Are some birds simply live closer to the feeders? Do Are some birds simply braver at approaching the feeder? What about not only the number of visits, but the, the time they spend sitting at the feeder and the latency to, to arrive at the feeder after a trial starts? These are the kinds of things we want to study, and we're not there yet, right? We aren't sure if there are differences in individual behaviors, but we're interested in those. So we have some work to do on this experiment. That's where we're headed. Okay. We can't use our experimental data to prove that black-capped chickadees are foraging to minimize their predation risk. We think they are, 
our data support that hypothesis, but we're not, we're not going to say, wow, we've just proven it to be true. And we think that individual black-capped chickadees are, are varying in their foraging decisions. We see evidence of bold versus shy animals, but we can't prove it to be true. We would simply maybe say our data support that hypothesis. Now, when you do science like this, uh, you come up with all sorts of other hypotheses that you want to test, or maybe that we tested along the way. What about weather conditions? If there's more snow or less snow, does that affect their behavior? Or what about the types of predators that we use? Or the positions? What if the predator is at one meter from the feeder versus five meters from the feeder? How does that affect foraging decisions? What about other birds that are sitting on the feeder? Uh, do the presence of big other, other birds that are big affect the tiny little black-capped chickadees or not? Those are all hypotheses that we could still address with our experiment or that we'd want to address in the future. And that's what's cool about doing science. When you start with a project, you end up developing more and more questions that you want to address and, and science just begets more science, right? And so that's the end of chapter one. To review this chapter, focus on material covered in the video lectures and the PowerPoints. Thanks.